Last Sunday, we studied about the uh, prophecies surrounding Jesus' birth. And we are so thankful that as far as mathematics, statistics, the laws of probabilities, and laws of chances are concerned, Jesus Christ fulfilled all those prophecies without error to the point. The name, the place, the, mer- the, the virgin birth, and, and today we're going to look at the participants other than uh, baby Jesus, earthly mother Mary, and Joseph. We will look at, the, at those who are pro-Christmas, uh, those who are looking forward to the birth of Jesus Christ. And there is also a group of people who is against the birth of Jesus Christ, namely Herod, the chief priest, and the religious leaders. And we will glean some insights as to uh, what, what these people are and who these people are surrounding the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's all rise and let's read our passage in Matthew chapter 2. Last Sunday, we, we take a look at another passage in Luke chapter 2. Now it's Matthew chapter 2. Let's all read this all together. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them, Where the Christ? The Christus, which means Messiah, the anointed one, was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Next slide. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back a word to me that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king departed, behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And then being divinely warned in a dream, they should not return to Herod. They departed for their own country and another way. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of his holy word. Shall be seated, please. What is so special about Bethlehem? The next slide. What's so special about Bethlehem? It is a small town five miles south of Jerusalem. It sits on a high ridge over 2,000 feet above sea level, where it can be seen easily. Didn't you know that Bethlehem was the birthplace of King David? It is mentioned in more detail in the Gospel of Luke, the one that we, we uh, studied last week. Luke also explains why Joseph and Mary has to be in Bethlehem when Jesus was born, rather than in Nazareth, their hometown. Hebrew scholars in Jesus' day clearly expected that Bethlehem will be the birthplace of their Messiah because they know Micah chapter 2. The next slide will tell us that this Bethlehem is part of the land of Israel which was divided into four political districts. Several several lesser territories, Judea, Judea, on the south, Samaria on the middle, Galilee on the north, Edomia on the southwest, Bethlehem of Judea had been prophesied by as the Messiah's birthplace according to Micah chapter 5 verse 2. Jerusalem was also in Judea, which was the seat of government of Herod the Great, king over all four political districts. But after Herod's death, the districts were divided among three parts. 
according to Matthew chapter 2. And although Herod was ruthless, an evil man, and a murderer in his own family, Herod the Great supervised those renovation of temple. He was, he was uh, obsessed with, with renovating temples and making it more beautiful, more larger, right? So this made him popular with many Jews. Jesus would visit Jerusalem many times because of the great Jewish festivals. And we could see that in four Gospels. Who is this first participant we are going to look at today? King Herod. The next slide. King Herod, this refers to Herod the Great, the first of the several important leaders or rulers from the Herodian dynasty who are named in the scripture. They were many, right? And so uh, Mark and, and Matthew and Luke, so you have uh, Archelaus, Antipas, Agrippa, and, and, and their wives. So that this Herod, the founder of famous line, ruled from 37 to 4 BC. He is, he is thought to be an Edomian, a descendant of Edomites, an offspring from Esau. Okay? Herod was the ruthless, cunning murderer, but he loved opulence and great building projects. And many of the most magnificent ruins can be seen in modern Israel as of this moment, right? So that Herod's most famous project was the rebuilding of temple in Jerusalem. The rebuilding of the temple located in Jerusalem which is Matthew chapter 24, right? The project alone took several decades and was completed until long after Herod's death. So this Herod the Great was quite troubled when he heard the wise man inquiring, right? He was troubled, disturbed when the wise man started asking within the community. So the word came to him and asked, who is this? Newborn king of the Jews. I am the king already. And then no, you're talking about a newborn king. So Herod was not the rightful heir to the throne of David. That's one. And many Jews hated him to be a usurper. If Jesus really was an heir, trouble would arise in the Herodian community. Herod was ruthless villain, and because of his many enemies, he was suspicious that someone would try to overthrow him, namely this newborn babe. Herod didn't want the Jews, a religious people, to unite around this religious leader that they were seeking. If the wise men were of Jewish descent and from Parthia, the most powerful region next to Rome, they would have welcomed a Jewish king who could swing a balance of power away from Rome. That's why Herod was disturbed. The land of Israel, far from home, would have been an easy prey for an Eastern, Eastern nation trying to gain more control as Assyria and Babylonia had done centuries later. So what insight can we glean from Herod's life? Matthew reveals that both Herod and the people of Jerusalem were troubled, according to Matthew chapter 2. When Jesus was born into the world, people immediately began to react. Some are happy, some are still searching, some are against. Jesus' presence did not soothe and comfort most people. Instead, they are disturbed, they are startled, they are they feeling insecure. So things have not changed much from that time even to our time. That people, that the Jesus stretches and disrupts people's lives. That Jesus will confront a lot of people, especially during this Christmas. Have you noticed that how many Christmas have you celebrated and the most popular character in Christmas time is Santa Claus? You can check it out with your grandchildren and children who is the most popular character in Christmas. I can bet a coffee for that one. The answer will be Santa Claus, not Jesus Christ. 
Because God entered our world in a person when Jesus was born, we dare not sit idly by ignoring and rationalizing our inaction. That's why here at NLCF, we always acknowledge that Jesus is the rightful celebrant of Christmas, the rightful King of the Jews. And we need to join Him, join with Him in building and advancing His kingdom here on earth. And every time we share the rightful King, the newborn babe, Jesus Christ, then we are joining in advancing His kingdom. Now that is Herod. Now let's look at the second group of participants, the chief priest and the scribes. And when he, Herod, gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, Herod inquired of them where the Christ or Christus, meaning Messiah, in Hebrew the anointed one, was to be born. So they, the chief priests and the scribes, the religious leaders, they said, in Bethlehem. See? Even the chief priests and the scribes, they know that Messiah will be born. They know their Micah, chapter 5, verse 2. In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet Isaiah, Micah. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, they are quoting from, from Micah, chapter 5, verse 2. Are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. The chief priests, the scribes, the teachers of the law, the religious leaders were aware of Micah. That's why they quoted Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one will come forth for me to be ruler of Israel. His times of coming forth from long ago, from days of eternity. Matthew, the gospel writer, highlighted repeatedly that they are knowledgeable. They know. They know their prophecy. They know their Messiah is coming. But it only stays in here. They still have their unbelief in here. They know, but they disregard. They know, but they cannot validate. They know, but they cannot embrace. See, anyone can know Christmas. But you have to validate it from here so that it will come out really there. The chief priests were the temple hierarchy. They were mostly Sadducees, the chief priests. <coughs> and the teachers of the law were primarily the Pharisees. They were the authorities of the Jewish law. And sometimes they are referred to as the lawyers. The lawyers. Because they know the Jewish law. They were professional scholars who specialized in explaining and applying the law. In front of the people. They knew exactly where the Messiah was to be born, but they lacked real, genuine faith. So you see, in this particular passage, they know the facts, but they will not embrace Jesus. We know there is Christmas, but how many embrace Jesus and celebrate Jesus during Christmas? A lot of people are, are depressed because, oh, what are we going to prepare this Christmas? Oh, we can always sit down with a simple dinner and then put Christ in the middle. There we go. We can have Christmas every day. Amen? People are thinking, how much is the lechon, the beef, and this and this? How much time can I give Jesus this Christmas? How, how about that question? How much time will I spend reading the gospel this Christmas? How much time will I spend zeroing in the Christ of Christmas and teaching my kids about Christ, not Santa Claus? The chief priests know the Christ of Christmas, but uh -uh, we're not going with the Magi, right? The wise men's inquired troubled Herod and the chief priests and, and these Jewish people expected the Messiah, but you see, most Jewish 
Most Jews or, or most Jews expected the Messiah to be their great redeemer, their great deliverer, their great military strategist who will overthrow Rome so that they can be freed. So when they heard that the prophecy was fulfilled and their redeemer was born in a manger, what? That's not true. Yeah, the place is good, but it's not in a royal one. These leaders were looking at something like Alexander the Great, you know, in a stallion with this and with all the battle gear to overthrow Rome. Baby, uh -uh. it doesn't work that way. They got their clues in Psalms chapter 2 and 1 Samuel chapter 2. Most religious leaders believe in this literal fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. Why? Because they know the law. They know the law. They believe that Messiah would be born in Bethlehem seven centuries later, but they lack their real, genuine faith that moves their feet to action, that moves their hands into action, that moves their lips and opens their lips into proclaiming the Christ of Christmas. That's why when, when we talk about Antichrist and the spirit of Antichrist, when did they start it? As soon as Jesus was born. The spirit of Antichrist started. As soon as, the, as soon as the Messiah was born, Antichrist started already. Well, starting in the heart of Herod, the heart of the chief priests and the scribes, they started it all. And over 2,000 years ago, the spirit of Antichrist is moving along very subtly and cleverly. Now what we need is the final Antichrist to rose into power. Next slide. What do we know about the wise men? Participant group number three. So hero, the chief priest, and the leaders. Now participant three, the wise men. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Hero the king, behold the Magi. That's the word translated from the King James and NASB, the Magi, and the other translation translated it, wise men. Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, saying, inquiring, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? And while their, while their caravans are moving, they're asking, have you seen the, the baby born in Bethlehem? Do you know, the, uh, do you know Micah's prophecy? Do, have you seen a baby born? Not just them who are, they have caravans. They have caravans moving. Imagine that. King Herod was sitting on the throne and these are caravans from the east asking, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? We have seen the star in the east. Who are these magi? Next slide. What do we know about them? The magi is an Old Testament term for magicians, astrologers, right? They were wise. Number, number one that I would like to share with you is those magi were not three, plural. The traditional notion that there were three kings, three wise men, stems from the number of gifts brought. That is where they traditionally assume, but not particularly stated in the Bible. Number two, they were not kings. They were magis. Magis and king, different. Magis assist the king. Why? Because they were magicians, astrologers, even during the time of Nebuchadnezzar. He has a set of magis, and, and scholars believe that they were possibly Zoroastrian wise men from Persia. Zoroastrian astrologers, magicians from Persia, which is our modern-day Iran. They, they, they have knowledge of the Hebrew scripture that could be traced back to the time of Daniel. That's when Daniel and the three friends rose into power when he became the head of all the magis. Daniel is the best of the best. That's where they learn it. 
Magi were, another translation of this is, they were a cast up educated man specializing in astronomy, astrology, and natural science. It's not just that they are playing, playing cards and shh, something like that one. It's not like that. They look at the stars, the positioning, right? The astronomy, the astrology. Tradition claims that there were three kings, as I alluded a while ago. And they were saying they had names. What were their names? Gaspar, Melchior, Balthasar. For crying out loud, where did they get their names? Gaspar, Melchior, Balthasar, and they were three kings. Kings of what country? During that time, Persian, the modern-day Iran, Babylon, the modern-day Iraq. What king are we talking about in here? Those traditions are unfounded. It's commonly the misconception that these magi or wise men saw baby Jesus in a manger. That is so wrong. That is so wrong. Because in our scripture reading, no magi, no, magi, no wise men, in a manger in the nativity scene. History reveals that the wise men came days, months, even after a year or years. In Matthew 2.11, the wise men found and worshipped the young child Jesus, not the baby Jesus. The young child Jesus where? In a house, not in a manger. Matthew 2.11, maliwanag pa sa tubig yan. Right? So that's why when you look at nativity, oh, ang ganda-ganda, it's just so nice nativity. And then you have the three magi, and then the animals and all of this, uh-uh, wrong. So wrong. We don't know where the magi came from or how many were there in a group because three different gifts they gave to Jesus doesn't mean that there are only three. Tradition has assumed that there were just three, three men on this journey. Now, they usually travel in caravans, not only three. Tradition also says that these men were men of high position, Pamparthia, near the site of the ancient Babylon, modern-day Iraq. Now, another question on the side is, how did the Magi, next, next slide, how did the Magi know that the star represent the Christos, the Messiah? Paano nila nalaman? The star, one scholar says, the star could not have been a supernova or a conjunction of planets, as some modern theories suggest, because the way the star moved and settled over one place. So if this is not a supernova or conjunction of planets, it is more likely, one scholar says, it's a supernatural reality similar to the Shekinah of the Old Testament based on, on Exodus chapter 13, verse 21. And the Lord was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them on the way and a pillar of cloud by night to give them light so that they might travel by day and night. Something to that effect. That is... But still, the question is, how did the Magi know that that star represents the Messiah? One, the Magi could have been Jews who had remained in Babylon after the exile and knew the Old Testament predictions of the Messiah's coming started with Daniel. Number two, the Magi may, may have been Eastern astrologers who studied ancient manuscripts from around the world and because of the Jewish exile centuries earlier, they would have had copies of the Old Testament in their land, in Parthia. The Magi number three, the Magi may have had special message from God, which is possible. Everything is possible with God. The revelation, the special message directing them to the Messiah. 
Another slide will tell you that some interpreters say these magi, wise men, were each from different land representing the entire world bowing before Jesus from different land. Bowing before Jesus and fulfilling the prophecy that all nations would come to him according to Isaiah 11 verse 10. The Magi were from faraway lands recognized Jesus as the Messiah, while most God's chosen people in Israel did not acknowledge Him. Shame on them. People from faraway land <laughs> recognized the Messiah, and you are where Jesus was born. You ignore the Messiah. That is why Matthew pictures Jesus as the king over all the land, not just Judea. Again, most likely the Magi knew the writings of the prophet Daniel in time past who had been the chief of the court Magi, seers in Persia. That is according to Daniel 9, 24 to 27. Also, this Magi may have been aware of the prophecy of Balaam in Numbers 24, verse 17, where Balaam's prophecy specifically mentioned a star coming out of Judah. Numbers 24. 17. Now let's move along in verse 13. And when they, the wise men, when they, the wise men, next slide, had come into the house, verse 11, when they had come into the house, not in the manger, they saw the young child with Mary, not the baby, the young child. And they fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts of gold, myrrh, and frankincense. And they were divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod. They departed from thence to their own country. To their own country. They did not originate in one. To their own country. Verse 12. This Magi wise man traveled according to history. The place where they congregate, going to Bethlehem, is approximately 800 to 900 miles. 800 to 900 miles. And just to put it in perspective, Minnesota to Toronto, Ontario, Canada, is 980 miles straight line straight line and that is equivalent to 16 to 18 hours of driving at 100 miles 80 to 100 miles per hour now just putting it in perspective these wise men traveled they walked with their caravan 800 900 miles in a rugged terrain, in a mountainous terrain. And we don't know the other factors. But upon founding this young child, after they troubled, they fell down, they worshipped, they opened their gifts. Now the next slide. What insights can we glean from the gifts Magi presented to Jesus? Gold, mere frankincense. Some scholars believe that while gold is a precious metal, such as a very valuable commodity, its value could have been very well have financed Joseph and Mary. Because they were warned by God that Herod will gonna massacre all the boys, all the boys, not the girls, all the boys two years and under. And because you are newly registered, they know. You've got to get out of Bethlehem. So this gold was used for their trip to Egypt, according to Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 to 23. The Bible does not tell us any other significance of these three gifts. However, tradition has it that there is a deeper meaning for its three gifts. One says that gold is a symbol of God's divinity. The symbol of God's divinity. Why? Because pagan uses 
gold in their idols. While the Ark of the Covenant of the Jews were overlaid with what? Not silver, but gold. That's according to Exodus 25. So that the Ark of the Covenant representing the presence of God overlaid with gold so that the gift of gold to the Lord Jesus Christ symbolizes His divinity. That's I would like to submit to you. God in the flesh. Frankincense. Frankincense is a white resin or a white gum and it is obtained from a tree by making an incision on the bark allowing the gum to flow from a tree. It is highly fragrant when burned and was therefore used in worship. When it was burned as a pleasant offering to God, so that frankincense, one scholar would say, that this is a symbol of His holiness and righteousness. Exuding from His presence that the gift of frankincense symbolizes holiness, righteousness, and His willingness to become a sacrifice for the entire humanity as a living offering. Finally, myrrh, also a product of Arabia and was obtained from a tree in the same manner as frankincense. It was a spice and it was used in embalming. Myrrh is used in embalming. It was also sometimes mingled with wine to form an article of drink. Such a drink was given to our Savior when he was about to be crucified. Stupefying option. So that Matthew 27, 34 refers to it as a gall. G-A-L-L. Mere symbolizes bitterness. Symbolizes suffering. Symbolizes affliction that this baby Jesus would grow to suffer, to be afflicted, and taste the bitterness of sin for every one of us. He gave his life on the cross for all who believe. There goes the significance of those three gifts. Let's close it with what insights can we glean from the Magi's participation in the birth of Jesus? When we look at the action words, these Magi were truly wise men because they read the Old Testament. They study the prophecies and then they believe in the prophecy. That's why wise men from the east came to Jerusalem inquiring, where is he who has been born the king of the Jews? All action words. It's not just by word. They read, they study, they believe, and they move. They traveled 800 to 900. And then, second, these wise men, these magi were truly wise men because they sought Jesus. They sought this newborn king of the Jews. Because number three, they recognized the worth of this Christ of Christmas, the worth of this newborn king of the Jews. He is worthy of worship and praise. And because of this worth, they humbled themselves by falling down and worshiping him. It doesn't end there. They opened their treasures and they presented gifts. All of this is an act of obedience to God rather than Hero the King. But they don't care whether Hero will send an assassin group to track them down because Hero's word is those wise men tricked me. They did not return to tell me where they found the boy. But they were wise because they read, they study, they believe. They sought Jesus. They fell down and worship in humility to Jesus. They obeyed God. Imagine when, when we look at the application of this, it's not a joke to just walk 800 to 900 miles. If you think you will walk from here to Toronto, how, how long do you think, how many days do you think you would need on a daily basis? 
Now, that's considering we have a paved road, right? They don't have a paved road. That will tell you that Jesus grew up when they, <laughs> when they saw him. But those were an act of faith because when they finally found Jesus, they responded with joy, worship, and gifts. Look at that. They are looking for the Messiah and they bring gifts. It's an opposite of what we are expecting from God that we expect God to come looking for us, for God to explain Himself to us, for God to prove Himself to us, and for God to give us all we need. I think the question with this participant wise man is, do you want to be wise like the wise men? Of course, the answer is absolutely yes. Do you want to be a wise man? Those who are wise will seek Jesus. Those who are wise will humble before Jesus. And those who are wise will worship Jesus. And those who, will wise, who are wise will present their gifts to Jesus. And that's why to be wise in our 21st century, we need the Holy Scripture. We need to read it, study it, we need to believe it. And we need to obey it. So that we will be transformed into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. Apart from this book, we cannot have transformation. That is our goal. That we will be renewed by the renewing of our mind through this book. So that we will be transformed. Our attitude, our behavior, the way we treat others, the way we treat our husband, our wife, our children, our parents. So that the Christ of Christmas is daily transforming our life. Not just making us holy, sanctified, separated. But this Christ of Christmas make us wise unto salvation. Amen? The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, than the honeycomb. This is it. So don't forget in Preparing your Christmas celebration, the Bible, okay? If you need to print it out, print it out. The last slide will tell us that you and I need this godly wisdom. We need this godly wisdom to guide us in 2022. We need this godly wisdom to help us navigate the 2022 challenges. The following verse is Colossians 2. In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Christ, not in religion, not in the church, in the person of the Christ of Christmas. Hidden are all the treasures and the wisdom and knowledge. Whether you're a businessman, a nurse, or a medical practitioner, the needed wisdom found in Jesus Christ. Proverbs 1.5, a wise person will hear and increase in learning and a person of understanding will acquire wise counsel. Again, this is it. Proverbs 3.7, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. A wise son makes a father glad. Are you a son who is making your father glad? I'm talking to you. Yes, yes, you. Are you making your father glad? Because if you are, then the answer is, you are a wise son. Because you make your father glad. But foolish son brings grief to his mother. What do we need to do? The second to the last slide. I thought this is the last. There is another one. We need to confess. This Christmas, we need to confess that Jesus is Lord and we need to believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead. Not just born in a manger and stayed in Mary's arm. No, no. He lived 33 and a half years, 
did his divine acts and performed miracles and lived out the truth. If we confess and we believe, we will be saved for out of the heart person believes resulting in righteousness and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. How do we know you are saved? The last slide. That's really the last slide. These things are written. The test, this is the testimony God has given us. Next slide and up. God has given us eternal life. Look at that. That baby Jesus brought us eternal life. See, look at that. This is the testimony God the Father has given us eternal life. And this eternal life is found where? In His Son, the baby Jesus. Not in the church, not in the religion, not in good works, not in money, nor education. This eternal life is found in the person of Jesus Christ. Those who have Jesus Christ has eternal life, and the one who does not have the Jesus Christ does not have life. And I don't care whether you have Blitzon and Hamon during Christmas without Christ, that celebration is nothing. So that your celebration and my celebration will only count if Jesus Christ will be lifted up in that celebration. Not with the gifts, but with Jesus Christ. These things I have written to you that you believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life.